Welcome to the Deep Dive, brought to you by Inside Texas Football, powered by InsideTexas.com. We need all of you to like our video, subscribe to Inside Texas Football YouTube channel, and of course, if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple, make sure you write a review, give us five stars, tell us how much you love it, and uh, we're delighted to bring you this content every week, along with all the other good stuff, both at Inside Texas and on the Inside Texas YouTube channel. Right now, use promo code IT1 to get two months of InsideTexas.com for one American dollar. I have done the maths on this, as they say in England, Ian, and that's 12 and a half cents a week. I think we can all find that in our couch change and get the best damn UT football site out there. Ian, what's going on, my man? You ready to talk about some win totals of Texas Longhorn opponents? Yeah, I just, I'm back in the homeland, great state of Texas. I've not finished moving in exactly, but thinking about going over to the local HEB and climbing under the Buddy Bucks machine and getting enough change to buy whoever makes the best comment a subscription to Texas with the change I find underneath it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I I, I was able to move back to Texas. All I would do is go to mega HEBs and Bucky's just Every day, I just drive back and forth. That would be my commute. So welcome back to the great state of Ian. And we are going to celebrate your arrival back in the great state of Texas, talking over-under opponent win totals. And we get to start off, without any further ado, with the Colorado State Rams. All of these win totals are set by FanDuel. uh, And we'll talk a little bit about some of the intricacies around the number as we go through them. But... This, of course, is the Texas schedule. We start off with Colorado State, August 31st in Austin, Texas. Vegas is setting their win total at six and a half. Uh, Jay Norvell, this is his third year in Fort Collins, right up the road from me. And first year, they went three and nine. The next last year, they went five and seven. And then finally, they're setting this win total at either six or seven wins in a 12 game schedule. What do you got for the Rams, Ian? I went under on the Rams. I Going in, I noticed their quarterback returns. He's got one of those long hyphenated names, so I don't remember what it is. His top receiver. Fowler Nicolosi. Yeah, that guy. <clears throat> His top receiver is back. That guy's been there forever. Yep. He has like multiple thousand yard seasons. He must be one of those guys that's like a 4'8", but knows how to get open, you know? Well, so actually – Let's. I'll. I'll. Uh, I'll. I'll correct you live stream here. Uh, so Tory Horton is his name, yeah. and he is an NFL receiver. He's a four five four four guy. What? He's about six two. Yep. And uh, Colorado State, believe it or not, for a G five team, despite their lack of success of late, actually spends money on football, and they want to be good. They have good facilities, and uh, basically, this guy Tory Horton is the best player on the team. He's going to be an NFL draft pick, and. He'll, he is looking for his third consecutive 1,000-yard-plus season. Uh, his quarterback like is Braden Fowler-Nicolosi, who was uh, – he's a Texas guy, like like half the quarterbacks in the country. He's from Texas. But, uh, yeah, they look like they might be pretty good on offense. Defense looks a little shaky. So what are you thinking? You're thinking it's a six-win team or like a four-win team? Are they going to vastly uh, undersell or, or you think they're going to just miss it? I think they're going to hover right around that number. I feel I feel a little bad about my under now, knowing that their receiver is uh, that talented. Um, their schedule is tough. The Mountain West is tough. There's a lot of programs out there that actually take football seriously. They have like Fresno State is out there. They're always loaded with receivers as well and quarterbacks. Yep. Just like that whole area, they everybody gets a quarterback from Southern California, from Texas. They load up on skill talent from from California or from like or from Vegas or somewhere. And um, it just makes a competitive atmosphere. So I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm under. Do you want to read the schedule? Uh, sure. Yeah, we don't have to go too in-depth. They, they do uh, open, of course, with Texas in Austin. That point is around that, – that spread is around 36, 36 and a half right now. They host Northern Colorado. And then the game of their season, Ian, they host the Colorado Buffaloes in Fort Collins – They've not hosted them there in two decades. It is going to be a huge game for them. And this is actually one of those low-key 
under the radar rivalries that actually gets pretty intense. Uh, so that I think is going to be the game that probably is going to be a key game of whether they go a uh, six and six or a seven and five. Uh, then they go to, they host UTEP. They play Oregon state. Uh, the disbanded PAC 12 is a betting that they host San Jose. They go to air force, always a really tough game coming to Colorado Springs for that one, about 10 minutes from my house. And then uh, they host New Mexico, Nevada, Wyoming, Fresno State, and Utah State. So I think their, their games that are probably going to determine their season is going to be Colorado, traveling to Air Force, and then going to Fresno State. Uh, I've got Texas comfortably penciled in as an L. So uh, I think there's a shot for this to be a bowl team, but I think you're right. I think this is actually six and a half is correct. I think there's somewhere between a six and seven win team. And I think how they do against Colorado might determine uh, how they go. I didn't find a ton of value in any of these. Maybe you'll disagree. A lot of these are set very, very well, in my opinion. Vegas is pretty good at what they do. And uh, I, I have found some win-loss uh, predictions or totals, I should say, that I do disagree with. I've already bet, but that's a that's a discussion for another another show. Let's go to the Michigan Wolverines, your old neck of the woods. You are what, 45 minutes away from Ann Arbor? I was much closer. Oh, okay. Never yeah. mind. Uh, Michigan set at nine and a half, defending national champions. They obviously lose quite a bit. They felt like every other name in the NFL draft in the first three rounds was a Michigan Wolverine. They still do bring back a bunch of talent on defense. Uh, they've got a new head coach in Sharon Moore. This number is set at nine and a half. And Ian, if you go through their schedule, there's really three games that are going to be a big challenge for them. And this win total tells you sort of how you feel about it. So uh, I'm not going to go through all of their games, but of course they do host Texas in, Ar in Ann Arbor. Later, they host Oregon in early November. And then at the end of the year, they are traveling to Ohio State. Those are their three most losable games. I, I think games against Northwestern, Indiana, et cetera, I think they're going to be just fine. Uh, what do you think about this Michigan win total? So I had over. I figured they had like seven gimmies, and then they needed to find three wins from Texas, USC, and Oregon at home, and Washington and Ohio State on the road. And – to me, that seems doable. So to me, like nine and three, 10 and two, and I would lean towards 10 and two. Yeah, I think they're going to smack Washington. I think Washington's going to fall off a cliff this year. Uh, I, I kind of have them penciled in as a seven and five football team. So I don't think they're going to have any problem there. I think USC could be interesting. I just think they're too physical for USC. So to me, it's Texas, Oregon, Ohio State. I think all three of those teams are better than Michigan, probably this year, but they Michigan gets to host two of them. So on this one, flip flip a coin. I think they're going to go nine and three or ten and two. I, I don't think there's any chance they're undefeated, uh, and I don't think there's any likelihood they go seven and five and have some sort of post Harbaugh disaster. Does that seem fair? Yeah, this is the game also where I'd be looking for Dylan Gabriel's small stature and questionable cold weather abilities to show up. Because that game is, uh, when, when is that? It's pretty late in the year, right? It's like November in, 2nd. Yeah. November 2nd in Ann Arbor is almost always like 40s, 50s, and wet. Hmm. If you imagine Dylan Gabriel in those conditions against this defense, I, I think that's win number 10. Isn't 40s and 50s Ooh. default wet sort of Oregon's weather for the winter as well? Yeah, I have a lot of question marks about Oregon and their – they may have to go to Dante Moore sooner than they would think. Ooh, well, that may not go well for them if they do because I watched Dante Moore last year and he does, he is the captain of the pick six. All right, <laughs> UTSA, Jeff Trailer, a guy that a lot of people are, are pulling for when they're not playing Texas. Uh, he has built a great program at UTSA. Uh, they're always relevant. I think he's 39 and 14 in his time there, which is really good. They don't have Frank Harris anymore. The doctor has graduated, Ian. 
Uh, they also lost their Frank Harris equivalent on defense, a guy named Rashad Wisdom, who was a four-year starter at safety for them and sort of the quarterback of their defense. However, they and, and they lost a guy named Trey Moore, star pass rusher. Yep. They lost Trey Moore to Texas. They also lost their best cornerback to Oregon, who's probably going to start for them. So had they kept Moore in this corner – I think this would have been the best defense at UTSA that Trailer has ever fielded. However, alas, the G5 is now a developmental league for the P4. So uh, they got plucked. Nonetheless, UTA, UTSA still has got some players. They have a favorable schedule once they get through some of the big boys. Uh, and let me give you an idea of what that is. They are going to play Kennesaw State, <laughs> Texas State, which actually would be a very competitive game. At Texas, uh, the HCU Huskies, at East Carolina, at Rice, Florida Atlantic, Tom Herman, at Tulsa, Memphis, which will be a good game. Uh, they host Memphis in that one. North Texas, Temple, at Army. And then they've got the uh, potential American Championship game. I think they're going to start the year probably two and two, three and two. And I think there's a good chance they win their last, I think they win their last six in a row. I think there's a chance they win nine. Ian, what do you think? I went over as well. I noticed that they have a couple of receivers back that were pretty good last year. They have that guy, uh, Amador, that play, ended up playing quarterback for North Shore when Duncanville beat him a couple of years ago. I think they really scout the state well. They get a lot of guys where you're like, oh, I remember that guy from high school. And maybe they're too small or not quite fast enough or something for big-time football that they can play. And uh, they also have uh, Josh McCown's kid, Owen, at quarterback now, assuming he wins the battle, which I think I'm pretty sure he is. So <clears throat> it makes me nervous that Frank, that Trailer, I don't know if he's ever coached UTSA without Frank Harris at quarterback. Maybe year one. Well, he has only when Frank Harris has been injured. So that makes me a little nervous, but I'm just – I'm betting on trailer. I'm betting on what they've been up to out there, and I'm going over. All right, this next team, my recommendation to you is this this is a team you will not want to bet on uh, unless you're fading them hard in 2024. That's Louisiana Monroe. Uh, they finally fired Terry Bowden. Yes, Terry Bowden was still somehow – convincing someone to give him a paycheck. They fired him. This program has been moribund ever since coming to FBS back in 94. They've had one bowl in their entire history. Uh, I think they've had two, maybe three winning seasons in the last 30 years. Their win total set at one and a half. Now, in fairness, that number is set to be exceeded at, at FanDuel, meaning it's, it's like minus 150. I don't know what it is. If you take the under, you actually get plus money. Ian, I think I would actually bet the under here. I think Louisiana Monroe is going to go 1-11. and And the reason is what talent they had from a 2-10 and team, and by the way, they lost 10 games in a row to close out the year. The best talent they had was all rated in the portal. So they are basically going to stock their roster with a bunch of last-second JUCO replacements and then a few guys who weren't good enough to go in the portal. This is going to be the, one of the worst football teams in America. We're going to see at least a half of Arch Manning. Yeah, I I have nothing to add. I looked at the schedule. I was like one and a half. And I looked at the schedule and I was like, I'm not, I wouldn't want to bet over against that. Yeah. That yeah. Be- hey, to give you a, a little idea how bad they've been, I hopefully you'll get a kick out of this. In their media guide, which I was researching, writing, of course, my Thinking Texas Football preview, which should be coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, Big news, breaking. That's right, breaking news. Uh, They have a season in their media guide called the Season of Magic. (laughs) (laughs) UL Monroe. And the Season of Magic was back in 2012 when they went eight and five. (laughs) And they lost a bowl game 45 to 14 to Ohio. Uh, Not Ohio State, the Ohio Bobcats in Athens, Ohio. So that gives you a little bit of context of Louisiana Monroe and what we're dealing with at that program. Uh, tough deal to be a, a Louisiana Monroe Warhawk. 
All right. I can't wait for that chapter. Talk to me about Mississippi State. Yeah, that chapter is very sarcastic. Uh, but uh, talk to me about Mississippi State Bulldogs and Jeff Levy. I like I kind of like the Bulldogs, um, but I can't go over because their schedule is brutal. Yes, it is. They have Blake Shapin, who I think is quite good. We've talked about that. They got a receiver from the G5 ranks who's pretty good. They had some other receivers around from the Mike Leach era. So they're not like um, – it's not like when Mike Leach took over for Dan Mullen and it was a team just built around running the quarterback 15 times a game to win. Um, they've been kind of overhauled for the spread. So I, I, I like Lebby there, but their schedule is just – I'll give you just a few snippets of the schedule. They've got – their non-conference includes at Arizona State in Toledo – the other two are basically gimmies. They have at Texas, at Georgia, at Tennessee, at Ole Miss is Dang. their road. And their home slate is Missouri, Arkansas, Texas A&M, and Florida. So, so their season upside is they've got to beat Arkansas, they've got to beat Florida, and they've got to upset A&M or Missouri at home. Fair? That's how they exceed expectations. Or Texas. <laughs> Yeah, well, they Texas they play in Austin, and I don't, I don't, I don't like that matchup for them very much. They, it's a at least it's a favorable time of year, almost. Well, maybe not actually. I think they get Texas after that, uh, after that ULM game, don't they? Yeah, and the, and two weeks before Oklahoma. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's a tough. Yeah, game. tough road, tough deal for them all around. Um, I mean. I don't think a lot of people realize or remember that last year was kind of supposed to be Mississippi State's dark horse year. They had a bunch of seniors, a bunch of bunch of fifth and sixth year players. But of course, Mike Leach tragically died. RIP Mike. And then they hire the defensive coordinator, Arnett, as the replacement. And he defensive coordinators up the head coaching job. He decides to go, uh, we're gonna, you know, we've got this team built around the spread and the air raid. And we're going to run the ball and we're going to play, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust. And he just destroyed everything to include the defense that he was in charge of. So just a shame for them. Uh, But I do think there's some light at the end of the tunnel, maybe for these guys in the sense that Levy does seem to know what he wants. He's recruiting pretty well. And uh, like any SEC school, they got some fans that are into the program and they'll pony up some NIL. There's another team like that, Ian. That's Oklahoma Sooners. Their number. Set at seven and a half. Talking about schedules, that back half of the Sooner schedule ain't kind. And of course, they play Texas and Dallas. What do, what do you think about the Sooners? I'm rolling. I got to stay on brand. I'm under for Oklahoma. And, and you're predicting them to go under, like they're going to go four and eight, three and nine. No, I think they, they have a, honestly, they have probably like a six win floor, five or six win floor uh, bar. I mean, they're going to win four games. If they don't win their four non-conference games, then their season is going to be just historic trash. Hey, tell the people they're non-cons. Yeah. They are going to open Temple. Then they get Houston at home, Tulane at home. You remember that Houston just hired Tulane's head coach. So both their programs are in uh, upheaval. And then they get the main Black Bears on November 2nd as an SEC buy in the middle of their schedule, which will be very welcome, I think. Yeah. Uh, of those four, Tulane is the only one with the pulse. Uh, they actually are going to be decent, even though they, they hired the, the uh, coach from Troy, who's actually a good football coach as a replacement. Uh, and they, they kept a little bit of the, their talent, but that's a very friendly non-con. So I think you can pencil them in for 4-0 and there. So the thought is, can they go four and four in the SEC and win eight, right? That's really what we're asking. Yes. Their SEC schedule is tough. They play Texas. They play uh, Tennessee. They play Alabama. Who else are they playing? It, in order, it goes Tennessee at Auburn, Texas, South Carolina, at Ole Miss, at Missouri, Alabama at LSU. Okay. Those are all very losable games. I think they can beat LSU. 
I That's, think that I think their season upside is going to be not getting ambushed by Auburn on the road. They got to take care of business there, and then they got to find a way to upset someone. So yeah, I'm all- torn on this one. I could see eight and four. I I could see that. Uh, it's man, Beaten Bow just needs to be a miracle worker with that offensive line, and Jackson Arnold needs to be the guy that they think he is. If he is, I think they can go eight and four. I, I think oh. it's a yeah, it's a health play. If they yeah. are healthy on the line and at quarterback, they could they could probably pull it off. Yeah, because I, 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 I like their defense in total yeah. and I really like their safeties. I love Bowen and Bowman. And I think they can be some guys that uh could elevate them a little bit on defense from what we've seen. All right, talk to me about the Georgia Bulldogs. This is a team where they're going to be favored in every game they play, Ian. So Vegas and FanDuel set it at 10 and a half. But a fitting introduction for Georgia. I want to talk to you about a guy who's favored in every transaction he engages with on your behalf, and that's Gabe Winslow. He is going to go undefeated for you if you dial 832-557-1095. You don't need any line. You don't need any spread. He's going to play the lenders straight up, and he's going to dominate them. He's going to own them. At the end of the day, you're going to have your house, and you're going to have a great deal. Give him a call. Uh, 20 years in the industry, lifetime Longhorn. He loves helping people out. He's licensed, of course, anywhere in the great state of Texas, but he's also licensed in several several other states. So even if you're not in Texas, give him a call. He's licensed in Colorado. Hint, hint. All right, give him a call, 832-557-1095. Now, let's go from one great individual to one potentially great team. That's Georgia. Their number's set at 10 and a half. I'll bury the lead here and, and just tell you, if I have to choose gun to my head, I think they're going 11 and one <sighs> tough and <laughs> they don't have an easy schedule, but I think they're going to be really good there. Let me just read the schedule because this one yep. is going to be, this is I think one of the toughest ones. They open with Clemson in uh, Atlanta. I ain't scared. I, I actually think that's like an, a gimme almost. I'm, I'm way down on Clemson. I think they are gone there. It's over. Tennessee Tech, okay, good. At Kentucky, at Alabama, Auburn, Mississippi State, at Texas, Florida, at Ole Miss, Tennessee, UMass, Georgia Tech. That's a lot of wins for sure. But the way I figured it, they cannot lose more than one of at Kentucky, at Bama, at Texas, at Ole Miss, Auburn, and Tennessee. And those are games that I've circled as being potentially losable. And to to run that without more than one loss to me, that's tough. Especially, Paul, in this playoff era, there's a lot less incentive to try to win all those games. Yeah, you know, Kirby Smart has been pretty much at the forefront of – resting his guys and platooning them through the whole season and sort of playing with the end in mind, right? SEC title game, playoff games. So do you want to win all your games? Yes. Will you do things to preserve the better, the health of your team so that you're peaking in December and January? Yes. So that is something that works against you. We're not going to see NFL style, let's rest our starters last game of the year if you've got the SEC title game berth wrapped up. But it does it does diminish a little of the, the urgency, right, for perfection. And uh, that could work against me, but I just think they're really complete, Ian. I think it's a hard team to play for four quarters and come out on top. I think the team with the best chance is Texas. And then from a matchup standpoint, I actually think Tennessee could give give them a little bit of a problem. So we'll see. It could be. Um, well, they I think they have some of their good defensive backs back. So I don't know about I don't know if I'm going to buy Tennessee. One more note though on the on the incentives. If you are if you miss the SEC championship game, but you can lock up like the top at large seed, and you're five. number five, yeah. then you're going to open probably with Liberty in the first round. And then the second round, you're going to get the big 12 champion. 
there's value in that. There's no doubt. Uh, you and I are going to have to do the math on the value of that easy setup versus pl- having to play an extra game, which has an inherent injury risk, right? we got to do the math on that sometime and figure out what that is. But it, the math changes if you're talking about trying to make the SEC championship game. Because then the because ex- then you're not getting you're not missing an extra game. The extra game is the SEC title. So it's like, do you want to go to the SEC title in order for a shot at the number one or number two overall seed? Mm-hmm. When yeah. if you miss if you miss the SEC title game, then you could go for the five seed and the easy path. Yeah, interesting permutations because you also don't know how to handicap how the SEC title game loser is going to be treated. Uh, I think, I mean, to me, a sophisticated committee doesn't penalize you for losing the SEC title game against likely the number one seed. They probably plug you in at that five seed, or at least you have a debate. So we'll see. All this stuff is, we don't know what's going to happen, but we're kind of trying to war game it in, in anticipation. Let's talk about Vandy. Uh, they got a player who I absolutely love from New Mexico State, quarterback Diego Pavia. He is, I'm not sure I could call him a great player but he is a very competitive player and he's a winner. Uh, And he's kind of the feisty guy that a program like Vandy needs. That said, they really disappointed last year. And are they going to struggle to exceed two and a half? I I think they can go three and nine, but uh, I guess that's damning them with faint praise, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that line is bait. They have, uh, they opened Virginia tech, Alcorn state, and at Georgia State. So if they, they got to get, get two wins out of those three. <laughs> then they get Ball State later. Oh, okay. So I, I'm comfortable now. They So they can win three of their non-cons. Virginia Tech will beat them. Uh, they, they can win three of their non-cons, and all they need is one upset in the SEC. And they're they, not only do they make that number, they make it with distance, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough because it, <laughs> – they everybody poaches their roster every year. Yep. And uh, yeah, I, I think I'm with you. I think it's over, but it it feels like you're just like trying to trying to grab the cheese out of the mousetrap. All right. Very quickly, I think everyone has talked about Florida and the incredibly hard schedule they have. It's the hardest schedule in college football. Some people have dug in and said it's the hardest schedule in the last two decades of college football. Uh, Billy Napier obviously fighting for his job. This number is from FanDuel. You can actually find five and a halves out there. And, of course, you get a juiced if, – if you exceed that, you'll get a juiced payout. Uh, I think Florida's going to go five and seven. But I think uh, their key bellwether game is going to be when they open with Miami. And then I think they also have a pretty key game later when they play Kentucky. I think that'll probably determine a lot of their season outcome. What do you think, Ian? I would go over unless I knew that Napier was going to pull the plug early and just play DJ Lagway for the excitement and the hype. Yep. In order to preserve his job. Because, I mean, there's an argument to make. It's like, if I'm going to get fired after this season, if I don't go, like, what, what does he need to do to not be fired? Six wins? Seven wins? Seven would keep his job for sure. So if it's like, if I have to beat – you know, Georgia and Alabama or something crazy just to get to seven. Maybe my path to job preservation is just to play this exciting freshman, lose games, but be like, hey, but don't you want to hang on to this guy and not see him enter the transfer portal? Don't you want to keep me around to develop this guy? So that would be, I think that's the, if you think that that's going to happen, that's the under bet. And maybe you would wait for like that Miami game, right? Maybe you would wait for week one and if they beat Miami, if they lose to Miami, you immediately just take the under because you're like, he's going to bail on this season. Interesting. Very interesting. All right, let's talk about a, a, another coach just like Billy Napier. He's fighting for his job. He would have been fired last year, Ian, if Arkansas had the money to do it. That's that's Sam Pittman. They went four and eight last year, I believe. This win total set at four and a half. A little bit like Florida, you can actually find a five and a half number or a five number at other books. Um I think they have a good shot at five and seven. They really have upgraded at quarterback by adding Taylor Green from Boise State. They actually have a good defensive line kind of on the down low. They just have problems on the offensive line and problems at defensive back. 
And in modern football, Ian, those are not two position groups where you want to have deficiencies, <laughs> even if you've got talent at the skill spots. Uh, what do we think about the Arkansas Razorbacks and uh, their land and weight, obviously, for Texas and Fayetteville? Yeah, I'm over on four and a half, but if I had the five and a half, I would not be very comfortable with it. I mean, it's like you said, you, you can imagine them like good defensive line, strong defense, and then a quarterback that can run the ball. You could see them building a winning formula that can scratch out some close wins. But uh, it's tough. It's a, it's a bad schedule. Yeah, I think they're going to be a five and seven football team, and I think they're going to have some decisions to make after the season. I think they can go six and six and, and quote unquote surprise. Uh, yeah. We'll see. Hey, let's talk about Kentucky. I think one of the things that Texas fans will have to get used to is the middle class of the SEC. They might be a seven and five team, but they're going to have four or five dudes who are going to get drafted. And they're going to have a couple of dudes on the field who are better than the guy that you've got lining up across from them, sometimes considerably better. That's Kentucky. This year they have a, a, an interior defensive tackle who's going to be a top five, top ten draft pick. He's a dominant player. Uh, they always have some defenders. They've always got some players. Uh, they got a tough schedule. I feel like we're saying that about every SEC team, about, except maybe the last one we're going to talk about. Yeah. Uh, right. What do you think about Kentucky and Stoops? I'll say this about Stoops at, at, in Lexington. He's got a high floor. And the ceiling is about an inch and a half above the floor. <laughs> you know, there's there's no ceiling, but the floor is pretty high. Is that is this going to be another seven and five Kentucky team, or are they going to slip back because of that schedule? I yeah, I went over. I think there'll be seven or eight wins, maybe nine, just depending on how that quarterback transfer Brock Vandegrift goes, because they have yep. a couple of receivers that can really go, and uh, they've been having like. They, they changed their strategy this year from instead of grabbing a solid G5 quarterback to come in and manage the offense, they brought a former like blue chip guy that couldn't start at Georgia. Yep. So if that like talent risk play pans out and it turns out Vandegrift is really talented throwing the ball and they can cite, get those receivers cited up for him, I mean, they could be really good. They could be nine or ten wins. Let me but, give you the winnable games very quickly, Ian. Yeah, Southern okay. Miss, South yeah. Carolina, uh -huh. Ohio, Vandy, yeah. Auburn, Florida. I think they'll probably split those two. Murray State, and then finally Louisville. Hey, fun fact, they've beaten Louisville five in a row. So, uh, And they did last year in a big upset. Okay. So, okay, time to take a media break. Ian, you don't have to take a media break. You're an adult. You're a grown man. Uh, I, I think they're going to be 7-5, and five, Ian. I think when the dust settles. So I, I agree with you, buddy. All right, let's talk about the Texas A&M Aggies. We talked about these brutal SEC schedules that, that dominate not only the Texas schedule, as we're looking at, but also their opponents. A&M, not so much, man. And the good teams they play, they get to host them in College Station. Uh what do we think? I think you and I have similar feelings about this A&M team, that they could be surprisingly competent and decent, but they need to, they need some good luck with respect to injuries. Talk to me about the Aggies. So I, I had them as likely to win five games and then needing to get uh, four from Notre Dame at Florida, Arkansas, Missouri, LSU at Auburn, and Texas. Yep. That's a lot. Maybe that's not a super clear. I kind of think they're going to beat Notre Dame in week one. Notre Dame has... I hope not. I've got money on the Irish and the under. Notre Dame is replacing both their tackles. They went to the NFL. Yep. They have a new offensive line coach. Well, he's been... This is year two. I've been corrected. Year two of this offensive line coach. Um, they, the legendary Harry He Stand is gone. Um, Plugging in Riley Leonard, who had to miss spring practice, which I think hurts a little bit, a quarterback. And AM is just loaded on the defensive line. So I, and Mel, Mike Elko is back. It's very easy for me to see Elko just kind of blitzing and destroying that Notre Dame line in week one. 
and short circuiting their offense. And then AM riding that to a, a victory. Yeah, I think they've got a favorable schedule. I mean, their toughest games are Missouri, LSU, and Texas, and Notre Dame. And they host all freaking four. I mean, that's pretty unbelievable. So yeah. even if they can split that in College Station, which I don't think is crazy or unreasonable, uh, they can take care of business in the rest of their schedule. Uh, other than Notre Dame, they've done. They've learned the SEC uh, non-con scheduling of getting, you know, New Mexico State and uh, McNeese and games like that. I mean, these are literally automatic L's. So uh, they really need to just not get tripped up against the Floridas, against the the South Carolinas, those kind of games. They just need to go handle business, and I don't think they'll do it in super impressive fashion. I think. Right. You know, I think they'll beat South Carolina 27-20. But uh, I think a, a, a W is a W, and they're trying to go 9-3. and three. And I think that would be a huge year for Texas A&M. I don't see any ceiling past that. But I also think their floor is a little higher than people think. What do you think? Final word. Maybe they could get to 10 just because of the schedule. Um, they really need – their own offensive line is, is pretty iffy. So 8 or 9. I guess the, the smart bet would just be always bet against A&M, right? Always bet them to just slightly miss the mark. And I'm sure that's what five people will say in the comments. But uh, they really are a potentially formidable-looking team. All right. Well, folks, that has been the Texas opponent win totals. That has been Ian Boyd. He is a Sooner hater and an Aggie lover. Let him know in the comments how you feel about that. And please like and subscribe our videos and certainly subscribe to the YouTube channel. Go to, go to InsideTexas.com. A buck gets you two months with IT1 promo code. And then finally, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, uh, just write a nice review. Give us five stars. Let us know what you like. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. This has been The Deep Dive. Y'all take care.